Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Cinematic Excrement. Strong enough for a man, but pH balanced for a woman. Join me, if you please, for a little discussion on Total Recall. Directed by Paul Verhoeven and starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sharon Stone, Ronnie Cox, and Michael Ironside, 1990's Total Recall is a sci-fi classic. Based on the short story We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by acclaimed author Philip K. Dick, the movie has basically the same premise, though where it goes with this premise differs from the source material quite a bit. Schwarzenegger plays Douglas Quaid, a man who is sick of his boring life and longs for something more. Specifically, he wants to visit Mars, a place he has recurring dreams about, but his wife doesn't think that's such a good idea. Since he can't go there for real, he visits Recall Incorporated, a place that can create artificial memories of a trip to Mars and implant said memories into his brain. But during the process, he inadvertently discovers he really did go to Mars, and whatever he did there led to his mind being wiped and the recurring dream is actually a faded memory. The discovery brings the wrath of an evil corporation upon him, because it's a dystopian sci-fi picture, and of course it does, and Quaid has to fight them off and get his ass to Mars to learn the truth about what happened to him. This movie has it all. It's got Arnold Schwarzenegger in the prime of his career, plus great performances from the rest of the cast, the characters are fun and interesting, the special effects were really good for the time, the dialogue is fantastic, and of course features some great Arnold one-liners. See you at the party, Richter! It's got the campiness of classic sci-fi, the over-the-top violence of a Paul Verhoeven film, and a freaky mutant woman with three tits. Three tits, that's awesome. Overall, it's a hell of a lot of fun and I highly recommend it. But like anything that was popular back in the day, it was only a matter of time before we were treated to an unnecessary remake. That's pretty much how Hollywood operates nowadays, though it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes the remake ends up being pretty damn good. Sometimes it ends up being not so good, and sometimes it ends up being completely forgettable. Seriously, I know I saw the Conan remake, but I remembered not one frame of it. How is that even possible? Anyway, where does the 2012 remake of Total Recall fit in? Is it a worthy successor to the original, or is it simply a pale imitation? Let's take a look. A remake produced by a company called Original Film. Are they doing this on purpose? Much like the original movie, our main character is Douglas Quaid, this time played by Colin Farrell, an everyman who dreams of doing something more with his life. And he's haunted by a recurring dream where he's trapped in an action movie with Jessica Biel. But haven't we all had that dream? No. No, just me. Okay. But unlike the original movie, the dream has nothing to do with Mars. In fact, Mars has nothing to do with the movie at all, except for one scene where it's simply mentioned in passing. Went to recall for his bachelor party. Wanted to be king of Mars or some shit. Yeah, I'd like to go to Mars. Well, it ain't gonna happen this time. This is one of several references to the original movie, and unfortunately, none of these references are particularly clever. It feels like the filmmakers are making references purely for the sake of doing so. Just to remind the audience that yes, they did see the original Total Recall just like you did. It's like they're playing a game of Andy Richter's Memba This. Memba This? I wanted to be king of Mars or some shit. Yeah, I'd like to go to Mars. Memba This? How long are you here? Two weeks. Remember this! Trust me, baby. You're gonna wish you had three hands. Yes, I do remember all of this stuff from the original movie, and the only thing you're accomplishing with these references is making me wish I was watching that instead of your version. Remember the golden rule of filmmaking. Never refer to a better movie during your own. Well, since we won't be going to Mars this time, the entire movie takes place on Earth. A post-apocalyptic Earth, in fact. Thanks to a history of chemical warfare, what's left of mankind now resides in one of two habitable areas. The United Federation of Britain and... The Colony? Australia. It's fucking Australia! It already has a name! Why would you not just call it Australia? Do you not own a globe? I really don't get this. Even if, for some unfathomable reason, you absolutely had to give it a new name, could you maybe come up with something slightly less generic than The Colony? Oddly enough, the original plan was to call it New Asia. There's even a bank depicted in the movie that still bears that name. It's still kind of stupid since it's the wrong fucking continent, but at least it's slightly more creative than The Colony. 
And if you're going to use generic names, why not go all out? Why isn't the United Federation of Britain simply called The Federation? Why not call Quaid's place of business Factory? Why not make it like the host and have him shop for groceries at Store? Perhaps after work he could go for a drink at- Oh my god, are you fucking kidding me? Bar? It's just called Bar. You lazy douche clusters. It's a science fiction movie. Of all the genres of filmmaking, how the hell do you make a science fiction movie with such an amazing lack of creativity? This should not be possible. Anyway, Quaid and his wife Lori, played by Kate Beckinsale, live in a shitty apartment in the colony, which looks like the Hong Kong level from Deus Ex fucked an MC Escher painting. In fact, a lot of this movie reminds me of Deus Ex. Even the soundtrack sounds like it was ripped right out of Human Revolution. Both Quaids have jobs in the UFB, and like most people in the colon- uh, No, you know what? Fuck it. Like most people in Australia, they communicate to work on something called The Fall. This is basically a big-ass train that literally falls through a hole in the earth, passing through the core, and arrives in Britain 17 minutes later. Well, this is pretty creative, I'll give them that, but even if I accept that such a thing is scientifically possible, and it probably isn't, how exactly did they go about building the fall in the first place? Because there is probably a story there, and I'm willing to bet it's more interesting than what we're watching now. By the way, some of you are probably aware that I am not a fan of J.J. Abrams' extensive use of lens flare in his movies, especially the Star Trek films. Some people think it's an effective stylistic element, and some don't care about it one way or another. And some people, like me, think it's annoying and needs to die a horrible death. However, after seeing Total Recall, I think I owe JJ an apology because as annoying as his lens flare is, I think what director Len Wiseman did with Total Recall is actually worse. Almost every shot in this movie has some kind of flare going on, even when there's no visible light source for the flare in the shot. It sometimes obscures what's actually on camera, and even when it doesn't, it's distracting as hell. There's so much lens flare in this movie that there's a YouTube video dedicated solely to counting the lens flares. Wiseman said he used lens flare to make the film look more futuristic, which sounds ass backwards to me since modern film equipment makes avoiding lens flare almost trivial. If anything, it makes it look like he's stuck in the past, not the future. So if you know the story from the original Total Recall, this one starts out pretty much the same way. Quaid sees an advertisement for Recall Incorporated, a company that specializes in artificial memories. His co-worker Harry, played this time by Bokeem Woodbine, tries to talk him out of it, but Quaid goes to see them anyway and asks for a memory of being a secret agent. There's actually a pretty cool moment here where they incorporate a passage from Dick's original short story. An illusion, no matter how convincing, is still just an illusion. You're right, objectively. But from the inside, subjectively, I assure you it's quite the opposite entirely. It sure would have been nice if the rest of the movie was a more faithful adaptation of the original story. I'd actually like to see someone take a crack at that. Unfortunately, this is as close to We Can Remember It For You wholesale as we're going to get. They run some kind of futuristic, psychoanalyzing something or other on Quaid and discover, surprise, surprise, he actually is a secret agent. Doug, of course, doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, but before they can discuss the matter any further, several armed troopers burst into the room, killing everyone but Doug. How goddamn convenient. Doug tries to surrender, but suddenly something in him clicks and he kills every single one of the armed guards. That's right, he's surrounded by about 10 armed men and manages to take out every single one of them without getting shot. And while that shot did look pretty cool, I do have to wonder why it never occurred to any of these heavily armed troopers to just, you know, shoot Quaid. Especially since they just mowed down everyone else in the room without a moment's hesitation. Even if they've been instructed to bring him in alive, they have stun weapons. Quaid makes his escape and runs home to tell Lori what just happened. And if you've seen the original film, you won't be surprised when Lori attacks him. But you might be surprised by her magically losing her hair tie between shots. Lori works for the UFB police and knows Doug used to be a secret agent, but for some reason he had his memories replaced and she is posing as his wife to keep an eye on him. She even went through the trouble of adopting a phony American accent, though she drops it now that the jig is up. This, every, our marriage. What can I say? I give good wife. 
I still cannot get over how stupid that line is. And they actually put that in the trailer. Beckinsale's phony American accent actually brings up an interesting point. Everyone in this movie sounds American, even the actors who aren't, like Colin Farrell and Bill Nye, whose character we'll get to later. This seems rather strange considering most of this movie takes place in the UK and Australia. Were the producers really so afraid that American audiences wouldn't want to see a movie where everyone didn't sound exactly like them? Because that certainly wasn't a problem for Schwarzenegger back in the day. His movie made almost $120 million domestically. And that's 1990 dollars. Adjust for inflation and that's about $230 million today. Granted, Colin Farrell is no Arnold Schwarzenegger, but still, non-American accents should not be that big a deal in this day and age. Anyway, Quaid makes a break for it, and if the movie didn't look like a video game before, it certainly resembles a platformer now. It's like we're playing Super Dystopian Brothers. Why are these apartments so haphazardly constructed? And how are they floating in the air like that? Do the laws of physics no longer apply in the future? Quaid manages to ditch Lori and the cops when suddenly his hand starts ringing. Go, go, gadget phone! And it apparently becomes a video phone when pressed against an ordinary piece of glass. There is so much wrong with this that I hardly know where to begin. Even if I accept that all of this is scientifically possible, and it probably isn't, who in their right mind would ever have a phone implanted inside their hand? It's not like you can just swap it out for the new model whenever you want to upgrade. It's inside your fucking hand! And how did he not already know it was there? I know they wiped his memory, but surely he would have noticed something was in there. Hmm. I wonder why my hand doesn't bend properly. And it feels like there's something hard inside here. And every time I board a train, I set off the metal detector. Well, I'm sure it's nothing. And what's the point of the video feature? Do people in this universe normally walk up to random windows to take phone calls? That's a little weird. And why is it necessary for Doug to see the guy he's talking to? It doesn't add to their conversation or help him in any way. If anything, it would hurt him since it makes eavesdropping that much easier. It seems like this was added to the movie just to remind everyone that we're in the future, no matter how unrealistic a vision of the future it might be. We're gonna make this the futuriest future that ever futured. And yes, I know the original movie was also guilty of this to an extent, but for Hooven's Total Recall was meant to be campy and over the top. The crazy future tech fits the tone of that film quite well, but Wiseman's Total Recall has a darker and more serious tone compared to the original, and this kind of silliness just doesn't gel with what the movie is trying to do. It feels like they're going for serious and campy at the same time, and it just doesn't work. Also, it's amazing that Quaid can get a notification of a new message on that window, even when his hand is no longer pressed against it. Because technology is magic! Quaid cuts the phone out of his hand so they can't track him, a process that doesn't look nearly as bloody or painful as it should, and after retrieving some items from a safety deposit box in a scene that looks more like the Bourne identity than Total Recall, he gets his ass to Mar- um, Britain. Unfortunately, his fancy digital disguise glitches out upon arrival, and Lori chases after him? How the hell was she already there waiting for him? He had a head start on her, and since he got rid of his hand phone, she no longer has a way to track him. He hops onto a hover car, because it's the future, and of course they have hover cars, and say... Does anyone else think this looks familiar? Because it sure looks a whole hell of a lot like a similar scene in Minority Report which also happens to be a Philip K. Dick adaptation, and also starred Colin Farrell. And it's another reminder of a much better movie I could be watching right now. Literally seconds after he jumps onto the freeway, he is rescued by Melina, the woman from his dreams. How the hell did she find him so quickly? Is everyone in this movie psychic? What follows is a lengthy chase sequence where we learn that this ridiculous freeway system allows the hover cars to travel not only above the road, but under it as well. Well, that sounds like a terrible idea. There's nothing underneath the cars to keep them from falling. What happens if something malfunctions and the magnetic lock fails? Or what if some suicidal idiot deliberately disables it? Like this. Apparently the fools that designed this freeway system never took that into consideration. Because here in the United Federation of Britain, safety is always priority number two.
Quaid brings an unconscious Melina to his old apartment and eventually finds a recorded message from his former self. But this isn't just any recording. Remember, this is the futuriest future that ever futured. So it's an interactive recording. It apparently only responds when you ask it the right questions. Well, that seems unnecessarily complicated. What happens if he doesn't ask the right questions? Is he just out of luck? Oh well. Keep in mind, Hauser is leaving this recording for himself. You would think he'd want to keep the information and instructions as easy to follow as possible. By making it overcomplicated like this, he's only hurting himself. A simple recorded message was sufficient in the original movie. Why is it not a viable option now? Anyway, the talking head informs Quaid that his real name is actually Carl Hauser, and he was sent by Cohagen to infiltrate the resistance movement fighting for Australian independence. But then he met Melina, who convinced him to switch sides. Since the UFB is running out of living space, or at least that's what we're told, it's not at all apparent in the movie. Cohagen's plan is to invade Australia, wipe all the colonists out, and replace all the workers with robots. Fortunately, the robots have a kill code which is currently lost somewhere in the recesses of Quaid's memory, and Matthias, the leader of the resistance, should be able to retrieve it. Well, that seems like a pretty extreme course of action, don't you think? The human population is already a fraction of what it once was thanks to World War III, and now when you have a slight overcrowding problem, your first course of action is freaking genocide? Am I missing something? Quaid and Melina decide it's time to leave, but they're confronted in the lobby by Harry, who is trying to convince Quaid that none of this is actually happening. He's still strapped to a chair back at Recall, and this is all a dream and Doug has to decide whether he's telling the truth or if this is just a ploy to get him to surrender. Obviously, this is a callback to a similar scene from the first movie with Harry filling the role of Dr. Edgemar. But sadly, it's nothing more than a poor imitation of the original. It's not as tense or exciting as the 1990 version. It goes on way too long, and some of the dialogue is just stupid. I had to call her at work. She loves you, Doug. Lori didn't work. Last night, Harry. You're lying. Why are you lying to me? Only because he wanted me to. You lied because he wanted you to? The fuck does that even mean? In the 1990 version, Doug notices a bead of sweat slide down the doctor's face, which he interprets as a sign that he's lying, and he shoots him in the head. Similarly, in the 2012 version, Doug sees Melina shed a single tear and decides she must be telling the truth, and he shoots Harry. How ironic that a CGI tear is what convinces him this is reality. They duck into an elevator and head up a few floors, but when they get off, Lori is somehow waiting for them? She was still on the ground floor when they got in the elevator, and yet, A, she knew where they were getting off, and B, she somehow beat them there. And that's the second time she's done this in this movie. Is she a teleporter? What follows is a chase scene through the most preposterous elevator system imagined. Look at this mess. The cars are not just going vertically, but horizontally as well. And they travel between buildings. There is no way a system like this would ever be logistically possible. But that doesn't matter in Total Recall 2012 because this is the futuriest future that ever futured. Who cares if it makes sense? As long as it looks cool. And as if copying the look of Deus Ex wasn't enough, now we're copying the look of Portal. Any more video games you'd care to steal from, Mr. Wiseman? After that insanity, Melina and Doug somehow just walk right out the front door. What, Lori can't just teleport down there and stop him again? And they go to see Matthias, played by Bill Nighy, who is hiding out in a part of Europe that is uninhabitable due to air contamination. Matthias is basically this movie's version of Quato, but instead of being a freaky mutant something or other, he's just a regular dude. That's a bit disappointing. And now that they finally met, they decide to... wax philosophical for a bit? But the past tells us who we've become. The past is a construct of the mind. It blinds us, it fools us into believing it. But the heart wants to live in the present. Look there, you'll find your answer. This is all very fascinating, gentlemen, but uh, don't you have shit to do? I seem to remember hearing something about, what was it, stopping an invasion? Yeah, yeah, that was it. It sounded kind of important. Uh, maybe we should save all this intellectual bullshit for later? They try to retrieve the robot's kill code from Quaid's mind, but it turns out there is no kill code. It was all a trick to get Quaid to lead the UFB to Matthias. 
and sure enough, they storm the building and in walks Cohagen, played by Brian Cranston. Only 30 minutes left in the film and the villain finally graces us with his presence. But of all the times he could have shown up, why now? Yes, the movie mentions he's a former soldier, but he's a government official now. Surely he doesn't need to be on the front lines, especially when he's clearly not dressed for combat. It just seems like an unnecessary risk. Cohagen shoots Matthias dead, bringing Nye's five minutes of screen time to an end. Well, that was a waste of good talent. Thanks for coming, Bill. And now Cohagen is free to begin the invasion and restore Hauser's memory. This is an interesting change from the original film, as in that version, Hauser volunteered to have his memory erased in order to infiltrate the resistance, and him joining their cause was a ruse from the beginning. But 2012's Hauser had a genuine change of heart and betrayed Cohagen, who came up with the plan to wipe his memory when he found out. And now he plans to bring back Hauser 1.0 before he was, in his own words, corrupted. This makes the character a bit more sympathetic since, unlike the 1990 version of Quaid, this one's good guy nature is not an artificial construction. And while they may possess a different set of memories, Quaid and Hauser are, at heart, the same person. Which kind of goes along with what Matthias was saying earlier, come to think of it. Hmm. Well played, movie. However, it also makes Cohagen look like a complete moron for wanting to restore Hauser's memory since it clearly doesn't define who he is. He betrayed him once, it's only a matter of time before he does it again, and to further cement his stupidity, Cohagen leaves without bothering to make sure the memory restoration goes smoothly. What is he, a Bond villain now? Earlier in the film, they showed Quaid reading a copy of The Spy Who Loved Me, hinting at his desire to be a secret agent. But I didn't think the movie would actually become a Bond film. In any case, one of the guards cuts one of the straps holding him down, and Quaid kills everyone. And it turns out that guard was the guy Quaid spoke to on his handphone. So he shows up later just to get himself killed? Well, that's a pretty weak payoff for that plot thread. Meanwhile, the UFB is loading up the fall with as many troops as it can carry for the invasion. And apparently Cohagen is leading the invasion himself. Even though he's still not in full combat gear, he's wearing a fucking suit. And I still don't understand why he needs to be there. Oh right, because then we couldn't have a final confrontation between Quaid and Cohagen. And we must have that confrontation, no matter how contrived it may be. Australia gets word of the impending invasion, and their response is to just stand there and panic. Are you kidding me? Folks, there is a really simple solution here. The only way those troops can get into the country is through that big ass hole in the ground. Blow it up. If they can't get through the hole and dock at the station, they can't invade. Not one person in the entire goddamn colony thought of this. Jeez, death is too good for you. Quaid manages to sneak onto the fall before it can depart, plants a few bombs, and rescues Melina, who has also been brought along for this invasion. Which makes even less sense than Cohagen being there. And after they run into trouble from the troops, they escape by climbing up the outside of the fall? Oh yeah, because they'd totally be able to climb that thing while it's moving at a speed fast enough to get through the entire planet in 17 minutes. Of course, this ultimately leads to a fight between Quaid and Cohagen, and boy is it an anti-climax. Don't get me wrong, I like both Farrell and Cranston as actors, but I have a hard time buying Farrell getting his ass kicked by a man 20 years his senior. It just doesn't look right. In the end, Quaid wins the fight, the bombs go off, and the fall explodes, stopping the invasion. See? That's all you had to do. Blow it up. It's not that damn hard. And of course, the movie has to go to great lengths to show us that Lori survived the destruction of the fall so she could come back at the very end and get one last stab at Quaid. Jesus, we already had our climax, why is the movie still not over? Okay, now it's over. I don't know why they felt the need to expand Lori's role in this movie to such an extent, especially since the actress playing her is not exactly the movie's strongest performer. But I'm sure the fact that the actress is married to the director had nothing to do with it. I know, I'm a dick. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Total Recall 2012. 
Honestly, it's not all bad. Most of the acting is solid, there are some decent action sequences, and the special effects are pretty good. But the two best actors, Nye and Cranston, are completely wasted in this movie. Instead, we spend most of the film with Farrell, Beckinsale, and Beale, who are in order, great, mediocre, and crap. Beale was even nominated for a Razzie for this movie, but lost to Rihanna for Battleship. The visuals are derivative and marred by constant lens flare, the story isn't very strong, and overall it's just a pale imitation of Verhoeven's film. I'd advise you to do what most moviegoers did and not waste your time with this. Stick with the original movie, it's so much more fun than the remake. Now before we sign off, I would like to take a minute to talk about the extended director's cut of the film, which was actually announced before the movie hit theaters. Studios double dip on home video releases all the time, but to be warned about it in advance is a rare thing indeed. The director's cut does have a few significant changes, the largest of which is a cameo by Ethan Hawke as Carl Hauser. Apparently, he went to such great lengths to disguise his identity as Douglas Quaid that he not only had his memories replaced, but also got plastic surgery to alter his appearance. It is also made clear that Hauser did not intend to betray Cohagen, and the plan to disguise Hauser and replace his memory in order to infiltrate the Resistance was actually Hauser's idea all along, bringing the character more in line with the original movie. It also suggests the sequence of events may have taken place entirely in Quaid's head as he was stamped with a symbol at recall before they started the procedure, but when he checks his arm at the end of the movie, the symbol is no longer there. This corresponds to a similar theory with the original movie that fans still debate to this day. Did Quaid's adventure really take place, or was it all a fantasy implanted in his head by recall? But while the original movie intentionally leaves this open to interpretation, the 2012 director's cut pretty much removes all ambiguity and makes it clear that it was all a dream. There are a few more minor changes as well, like the kill code being stored on a black box embedded in Quaid's head instead of just a hazy memory. Also, Melina is Matthias' daughter. What effect does this have on the plot? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! And if you can believe it, the scene where Harry tries to talk Quaid down is even longer in the director's cut than it is in the original. That blows my fucking mind! In the end, while I think the director's cut is overall a little better than the theatrical cuts, it's still not enough for me to recommend it. Most of the problems are still there, and it even introduces some new ones. It's just not a very good movie. Next time, we're going to look at another sci-fi movie, and thankfully, this one is much more fun than what we looked at today. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. I'm gonna go throw up on something now. Okay.